verse 10 of Nehemiah 8. Thank you, David, for reading this scripture so well. Verse 10 says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would see Jesus, and we want to see him now. So speak to your people words that they need to hear. And may I not be seen, but may you be seen and glorified. In your name we pray, amen. I've entitled our time this morning, Strong Joy. If you can stay with me for about 25 minutes, I promise not to hold you much longer than that. Strong Joy. That word joy has many definitions. Um, there's one that catches my attention and it says simply, the condition when that one feels or experiences when one receives exactly what he or she has desired. Joy comes. And there are many people who chase joy in all its forms in order to experience that which their hearts have desired. I want you to know today that there is joy in the most simplest of things. I, I, as I told the saints this morning in early service, I remember when there were simple things that used to make my son's eyes roll back in his head. I would throw him into the air and catch him. And his eyes would do backflips. And he would land back in my hand. And then he would say, Daddy, do it again. Anybody know about that? There was a whole lot of children up here. I know these parents, these parents that came up today, just you wait. They're going to wear your arms out. Daddy, do it again. Children have this marvelous, and by the way, I had to catch them, you know. Because if I didn't catch them, I wouldn't be alive to tell you this sermon today. I had to catch them because the wife would let me know, if you drop, then she'd just be looking, Dwayne, that's enough. Has the wife ever said that? And you know, it's enough. When she tells you stop, that's it, that's my child. I know that's your child, but that's my child. And I would throw him up. Children have the marvelous ability to joy in the monotonous. To find pleasure in the simplest of things. But something happens to people as they get older. For some reason, our pleasure centers are not satiated by simple things. The pleasures and the joys have to be more complicated, more complex for us to experience that high. We see it every day right now abroad in our land is, an, is a heroin epidemic of epic proportions. I saw a picture this week, I saw a picture this week that a police officer took of two parents in a car on the side of the road, passed out. Father in the front seat, wife in the, in, in, in the passenger seat in the front, and the child is in the back seat, and they're passed out. Officers had to apply a special drug to bring them back. I'm talking about pleasures now. This dear doctor right here could tell you stories that would make your stomach turn about what he is seeing in the, in the, in the uh, emergency room. The reality is human beings are not satiated by simple pleasures after a while. They want more and more, and eventually they come to something that Charles, the great Charles Spurgeon says, they seek for pleasures on their bellies where the devil finds his. He says, in effect, that just as Satan was cursed and slithers around on his stomach. And the Bible says that the serpent finds his, his, his going about on his belly and, 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 and he eats dirt all the day long. That's his curse. Human beings have a, a marvelous ability to get down where the animals are to find their pleasures, their joys. 
I want to tell somebody today, I want to tell you some places where you're not going to find it. I know everybody won't stay with me for the rest of this sermon. So let me tell you about some spots where you're not going to find joy. You will not find joy in unbelief. I want to be very clear. There are some people who think, if I cast off all the stuff that I've been taught, if I put the Lord's commands and his strictures away from me, if I put myself out beyond where God can find me, I will have joy. I got news for you. There is no such place. And by the way, others have tried. Others better than you have tried. There used to be a man, an 18th century, century French writer by the name of Voltaire, who said, when I get done, there will be no God. That's what he said. I'm going to write God out of existence. And he aimed all of his gifts and his talents as a skeptic to tear God down. But he also wrote at the end of his life, I wish I had never been born. Some people think that it's a unbelief. Others think if I pursue pleasure unfettered, I'm going to be all right. I just want you to know it's been tried. It's been tried. Lord Byron the great romantic poet, loved all kinds of people. He loved family folk. He laid down with family. He laid down with friends. He laid down with men. He laid down with women. And he reported at the very end of his life, the canker worm and grief are mine alone. I want to tell you that if you're trying something to find joy that is beyond the God we serve, I, I can save you time. <laughs> there is nothing out there that's going to measure up. Uh, it is reported that Napoleon, after he conquered his final uh, world, his final uh, uh, territory, sat in his tent and wept and cried, I have no more worlds to conquer. So if you think that achieving some position or some place or achieving some dream is going to get you the joy you want, I want to save you some time. There are those who think that God is a great kill joy. Oh man, I would be so awesome if I didn't have God. God is a great killjoy. But my Bible tells me that in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, when the angel announces the birth of Jesus, he says, I bring you great tidings of great joy. The Bible says that Jesus, uh, uh, I, I want to make a distinction here. The joy spoken about is not just the fact that it is God's salvation that is coming, and that is joyful and a reason for us to celebrate. Jesus himself is joy. So it's a celebration, not just of what he's bringing, it's a celebration of him, that he is joyful. The Bible tells us that Jesus and God is not trying to mess with our joy. He said, listen, disciples, I'm telling you the things I'm telling you, that you would remain in me and that your joy would be full. Right now, you got a little halfway joy. I'm trying to get your joy up. I'm trying to get your joy up real high where it's topped off and it's beautiful and it's overflowing and others can see it. God is not trying to mess with our joy. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, they said to him, Master, this man, uh, they said to each other, the Pharisees, this man receiveth sinners and he eats with them. That was the charge. He eats with sinners. You know, you really don't sit down and eat with people you don't like, generally. Now think about that for a minute. Jesus got accused of liking sinners. Jesus was accused of being with people who were problematic to the general society. And the Bible says that in response to that charge, Jesus tells three stories. One about a lost sheep, another one about a lost coin, and another one about a lost boy. And the, the high point of every story is joy. Because around Jesus, lost things get found. Come on, somebody. Lost people get found. Lost sheep get found. Lost coins get found because when Jesus comes in, he brings joy. And the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices over one sinner that comes to repentance. Would somebody say amen to that? 
Ah, but Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, I got another story I want to tell you. And here's what I want to tell you today. That there is a kind of joy that God gives that you can't get anywhere else. I know we've been in a different kind of series here. We've been talking about the 27 fundamental beliefs of the church. But the more that I talk to people, I felt impressed to, to break that pattern today and talk about this thing. Because so many Christians are living joyless lives. I mean, I know all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. I'm not going to tell you no story. You're going to catch a little hell before heaven. That's a fact. The Bible tells us, Jesus says, if, he, if they, the Bible tells us, if they do these things in a green tree, meaning if they did it to me and I'm the best that came down from heaven, what do you think is going to happen to you? But brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. Just because we're going through some stuff doesn't mean we can't have a little joy. Just because we're suffering some things down here does not mean that God does not have some joy for us amid the pain and the suffering that we endure. So what is Nehemiah saying to us? Nehemiah is speaking to a people who have just experienced an amazing blessing. Nehemiah has returned to Jerusalem, and in 52 days, how many? 52 days, Nehemiah leaves the people of God to rebuild the walls of the city. 52 days. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15. They, they, they were hopped up on some good. Has God ever done something for you that is so amazing that you can't put your fingerprints on it? I mean, has he ever blessed you in a way where, where all you can say is, yeah, that's God. And, and the people come, you know, you want to steal the Lord's blessing. Well, it was because I was so brave, you know, I just, um, you know, I studied so hard and I worked on that. And, you know, it was because of my, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my parentage. I mean, I'm blessed. But you know good and well, that thing was God. I told the saints this morning, I was sitting in my dormitory trying to figure out what I was going to do after graduation. Okay, and my options. Okay, go home, get your job back at Sears, you know, in the shoe department. Or there's always the backup, pump gas. That's what I'm thinking. All of a sudden, one day, I'm in the dorm, senior year, and an envelope comes. Open that envelope. Mr. Esmond, you have been accepted to Pittsburgh State University on a full scholarship for your master's program. Mr. Esmond, we not only will pay your scholarship, I'm paraphrasing them, but we want you to be a graduate teaching assistant, teaching freshman composition, and we will pay you. I'm just saying, I want, I want to say it's because I was faithful. Well, you know, these things happen to the people who know the Lord. That's all I'm saying. But you know good and well, that's nothing but the grace of God. I later found out how it happened. Lady never told me, but I did. I had to trace down. You know, you're not supposed to look the gift horse in the mouth. This was one I wanted to look in the mouth. I wanted to see what gift horse brought this thing. I know it was the Lord, but how did he do it? How did he pull this trick off? And I found out that the head of my department in the English department had, had applied in my name and didn't even tell me. I'm talking about God. There's some stuff that only God did. And it ought to tell you that you can have some joy in the middle of your pain because God is on your side. No matter how bad or how dark the day. And there I was taking the bus out there with my little self to go get my degree that's all paid for. Brothers and sisters, Nehemiah says to them, 
Listen, we're going to hold a big feast, a big celebration, and everybody gathers for the celebration. And they were so pleased and so blessed and so amazingly touched by what God had done in building the walls of the city that they said to Ezra and Nehemiah, we want to know what God has said in his word. Read the Bible to us. They all gathered, and they fashioned a, a very high podium, and Ezra walked up on the podium and started reading the Pentateuch to them. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I mean, he's reading the whole thing. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's reading the entire Pentateuch. It takes him half a day. Straight. Nonstop. He just reads, reads, reads. And while he's reading, the priests are explaining, this is what this means. When it says this, this is what that means. This is what that means. And when the people got a sense of what God wanted for their lives and where they were, the Bible says they started to cry. Ooh, talk to me. Has the word ever broken your heart? I mean, has, has it ever messed with your system? Have you ever approximated the distance between where God intended you to be and where you were? I'm talking about because of your own sin and your own iniquity, delaying, changing the course of your life. Have you ever seen the distance? They caught a glimpse of where God wanted them to be. And the Bible says that when they caught that glimpse, they started to cry. They fell on their faces. Read it. They fell on their faces and they began to worship God and beg his forgiveness. Ah, oh, but just as they began to cry and weep, the Bible says, Nehemiah, Ezra, and the priest said, no, stop. This day is a day for joy. This is not a day for weeping and for crying. The first thing I want to tell you today is the joy that Nehemiah talks about in Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 is first preceded by repentance. It's preceded by repentance. Not repentance that God asked for. It was a repentance that came organically from their look at God's word. It broke them to the point where they wanted to give up some things. Even though the day was a day of joy, the word had reached into their hearts and broken them. It was preceded by repentance. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, there are some people who can't experience joy because there's stuff in their lives that is not right. They have not repented of certain things, and it's blocking their blessing. They're blocked, hemmed in, blocked up. And then there are others whose repentance ain't genuine. Lord, I'm sorry. Okay. And go on and live. The, you know, it ain't genuine. Now, we, we know those sins that we really repent of, and then we know those others that, you know, we, 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 we say we repent, but then we just keep backing up to them. I'm trying to get away from this sin. You know, sin is over here. We're just backing up. To, I'm trying to get away. You know what I'm saying? Those, those, those pet things that we pet. And, and, and we let grow. And, and, and we bathe. And, and we put clothes on them. And we hide them when the friends come around. We hide it. Those sins that stand in the way of our blessings that we don't truly repent of. I, I, I told the saints this morning the story of, of this man who was teaching, he was teaching some prisoners um, in, in a class in prison, and, and, and the rule in the class was nobody could go to sleep. You can't go to sleep in this class if you're going to be in the class. And everybody who opted in to go and be, be taught could not, could not sleep in this class. But there was one guy, he could not keep his eyes open. The minute the professor guy started teaching, he would fall asleep. <sighs> the guy would walk over and shake him. Hey, man, get up. Here we go, oh, here we go. He listened for a few more minutes, back to sleep. The guy go over and shake him. Finally, the professor shook him one time. He woke up mad. He said, if you touch me again, I might kill you. The professor said, well, that's a good time to call the guards. <laughs> I perceive we're going to have a problem here. So the, professor, the professor calls the guards, right? The guards come, they take them, they throw them in solitary confinement for two weeks. They put them in a hole. He comes back. Are you ready to go back to class? Yeah, I'm ready, man. I ain't going to sleep. He comes back to the class. He decides that he's going to go to the professor and tell him he was sorry, repent, you know, I was wrong. 
He goes to the professor and he says, I said I might kill you. I didn't say I would kill you. I said, might. <laughs> that, that repentance ain't genuine. That joke of liable to stab him the minute he got wake up. You know what I mean? That wasn't no genuine. Some of us, the repentance ain't genuine. But this repentance preceded, preceded by repentance. The joy was sweeter because everything was cleaned out. Point number two. Point number two. Not only was, was this joy preceded by repentance, this joy was provided by God. It was not a joy. It, he did not say that the joy that you manufacture is your strength. Uh, Nehemiah didn't say, it's, not, it's, 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 it's just the joy that comes when you're hanging with your family. That is your strength. There's the joy that's, that when your bank account is nice and thick and big and, and you've got security and, and the money you've got put away, that is your strength. No, Nehemiah said, this joy, the joy that is your strength, is the joy that is of the Lord. That's a very important point. Joy that is of the Lord is strong joy. The Bible describes God in very powerful ways. It calls him a tower of refuge. It calls him a rock. It calls him the all-sufficient one. It calls him the almighty. Anything that comes from God is strong. I looked up the definition of strength. Strength has a couple of definitions. Uh, doc, Dr. Lil Caesar, um, one, one of those definitions was the condition of being strong. Now, you know good and well, when you're going to define a word with a word, that's the problem. Why did they even bother putting that in the Elder Mugan? Why do they have that in the dictionary? We don't need that definition for strength. But I kept on reading and I found another definition. This one said the condition or the ability to remain unmoved or unbroken by any external force. The condition to remain unmoved or unbroken by any external force. Strength. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one right there. The Bible is saying to us that when you are happy in the Lord, it gives you the capacity to remain unmoved and unbroken by opposing forces that come to us. Have you ever been in that situation where you met some forces you couldn't control? And the Lord raised up a standard against them. Come on, somebody. Raised up a standard and kept them at bay. I've been in that situation and seen God raise up his force. I remember one time I thought I was going to have to kill somebody one time. Not that other time I talked about. This was another experience. I'm not getting into it. I'm leaving that alone. I'm past that now. But I watched a guy that I thought I was going to have to fight. Because he was messing with my, it was my girl at the time. There I go again, right? And sure enough, I, I, I figured it was on the campus, man, at Oakwood College at the time. I figured, okay, the campus shrunk down. It was like gunfight at the OK Corral, me and him. All of a sudden, the guy comes up to me and just apologizes. Man, I'm sorry, man. I apologize. And you know what I thought? Yeah, you know. I'll bust you in your eye. You know what I mean? That's what I thought. Later I found out what really had happened. My wife called her daddy. He fixed it up. I'm just saying. Sometimes God does things for us that are absolutely amazing and leaves us unmoved and unbroken in the situation that strong joy but not only was this joy preceded beloved by repentance not only was it provided by god but the third thing and final thing i want to say to you is this joy is found in the province of holiness i want to say that again this joy is found in the province of what holiness now i know what you think to be holy is to walk around with a face like a prune. Brothers, I have been with the Lord. Praise God. 
We have been having fellowship. Can't you see it on my face? Have you ever, you ever seen them people so holy that they haven't told their face? They holy, baby, but the face don't know it. It hadn't traveled up from the heart to the face yet. And so they look, and you look at him, and you think to yourself, well, if that's what it looks like, I'm going to just stay right where I am. I'm good. I'm good with that. But uh, why is it that we equate certain things with holiness that are not even related? Um, and I'm not saying that it's wrong now to keep a nice, good, stern Christianity. <laughs> I'm not saying if it works for you, I'm not going to knock you on it. I'm just telling you that there's another option where you can have joy that God and people can see on your face. And that is so infectious that people want what you got. Lord, have, a, have you ever been around people like that? Their, their, their joy in the Lord is so infectious you can't wait to get around them. I know some people like that. When they come around, everything just gets better. Boop. Everything just gets better because of their love for the Lord. And they keep you grounded. I know some people. I remember I was working, I was working <laughs> at, at, at a place, and there was a guy over there. One, an old elder from my church worked in another part of the building. And I would just go to, now all he did all day was just fix boxes for shipping. That's all he did. He was a packer. He'd pack the boxes with the books and just ship them out. But there was a steady stream of people coming down to his area. They're not shipping anything, though. They're just coming down to his area. About to make the man lose his job. Just coming down. Why? Because Elder Miller had that marvelous ability to lift your spirits. People used to, I used to just come down and do a drive-by. Hey, Elder Miller. He said, how you doing in the yard, young man? How you doing in the Lord? I said, Elder Will, I'm, you know, it's, it's, things are a little... Things a little funny. He said, man, come over here. Let me pray with you. That's the kind of person. Still that kind of person. I talked to my sister this week. Elder Miller has retired in Atlanta, Georgia with his family. My sister told me this week, I met this guy named Elder Miller. He is so nice. He is a blessing to me. Isn't that amazing? Christians who embody joy. Ellen White says in that wonderful book, Steps to Christ, chapter 13, Rejoicing in the Lord, she says Jesus was a man of stern purpose. He was focused on what he came to do. But she says his countenance never bore the imprint of gloom or despair. Ever. She said that people would come around him and he would lift them up because he carried with him at all times faith, righteousness, joy, and gladness. Oh, mercy. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, Christians who call him their father ought to have a faith that is so infectious and so beautiful that people want to be around them. And if you want to know whether you have it or not, I have a test for you. David Doggett, I got a test. You know what the test is? Children. If you want to know whether or not you really have joy, hang around children. If they run from you, <laughs> talk to me. Hi, baby. How you doing? 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 If they run from you, you got to get your joy quotient up. Come on, somebody. If you want to know, the Bible says that, that they used to run to Jesus. They found him to be an infectious Christian whose loveliness they wanted to bask in at all times. So much so that the disciples would try to shoo them away. How could a man preaching such a powerful gospel on the planet love little children so much that they feel comfortable in his presence? Why? Because Jesus was infected with joy. The Bible tells me that is true. I'll close with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy. 
For the joy that was set before him, the Bible says he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus looked at the joy that would come from saving you and me, and he said, I could get through this cross. I'll make it. I don't care how bad it gets. I'll swim in the ocean. I'll climb any mountain because this joy that is set before me is worth the pain. It's worth the pain because Dwayne is going to have an opportunity to be saved. It's worth the pain. Oh, beloved, I don't know about you, but I get excited when I think about the fact that Jesus endured the cross for me. When we were running that marathon, it got a little tight. <laughs> Did it get a little tight? So we, how many know, on marathon day, things don't turn out as planned. Isn't that right? You're running along, ooh, okay. Running, running, running. Then you hit some mile and something back here say, you know what I mean? And you say, well, I ain't never felt that. I didn't even know I had one of those. You know, that, jo that joint is tweaking and twirling and doing stuff. And you think, oh, I'm just going to run that off, you know. I saw people, after a while, they were just like, you going to make the bridge? Because you got to get to the bridge by a certain time, or they just pick you up. We'll send the car. Just stay right here. Okay, carry you in. Right? You got to make the bridge. You got some people. Preacher just told me one man paralyzed, running with an exoskeleton. It's a machine on his body. He ran the last 6.2 with the skeleton on. I saw another guy, no leg. One of his legs was gone. He was running with, 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 a, with a metal piece and was running the whole marathon that way. I saw people wheeling themselves. Everybody pressing for the joy. What joy? The joy of having that soldier, that Marine. When you got to the finish line, the Marines were lined up. They lined up. And when you come through that line, it's one of the greatest marathons to run. They call it the greatest people's marathon in the nation. It's in the top five marathons to run. When you come through that line, all the Marines are lined up, and every one of them shakes your hand. And it doesn't matter your time. <laughs> the, the folk who got there fast, the, 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 the two-hour, 35-minute people, they done. And, and, and stand, one of them was done, rich, and came around cheering us on. <laughs> Keep going, baby. Metal, metal just swinging all around. Keep going, you got it. You did it, you get it. I looked at that chick, I was so mad. I said, you know what? You ain't got to come out here like this, you know what I mean? But the fact, they would all, they all shook your head. You didn't get your medal just when you crossed the line. You didn't get it then. You had to go the gauntlet. All of them shook your hand. All of them telling you, great job, you made it. You're a marathoner. You're a marathoner for life. They shook your hand. And then, then they take you, you go all the way out past that gauntlet, and then there are these metal rows. And all at the end of those rows are people with medals waiting on you. You get down your row, pick a lane, you get down there, and the, the soldier waits for you. He salutes you. You bend your neck and he puts it around you. They hug you. The Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. How many people are going to follow through and show up in the kingdom when we're going to have the celebration. My appeal this morning is very simple. If you are here and you know there is something blocking your joy, I want to pray for you. I want you to come. You know there's something in your life that's blocking your stuff. And you want to say, Lord, I give it to you. Come, let's pray. Let's talk. Let's talk to God. Are you here? 
What you scared of? You want to come? Hallelujah. You want to come? You brave enough? Lord, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Nothing, nothing, nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. I want Jesus' joy. Come. Preacher, I heard you say it this morning. Close the windows. <laughs> Shut the doors. Put down the garage. Don't let the devil get in and steal your joy. Are you here? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? I don't want to make it long. I don't want to belabor it. But you want to say, Father, nothing between. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Are you here? Nothing! He is meant to rejoice over you. Come. Come. There may be somebody here under the sound of my voice. There is some painful situation in your life that's messing your joy up. It's not some sin in your life. It's a situation in your home or in your job or something that has run off with your joy. If you are here and that is your challenge, come. Let's pray. Let's talk to God about it. Let's talk to God about it. He says, let me tell you something. I, I, I'm not going to have any problem confessing you before my father. Why do you have a problem confessing me before men? Come. Come. God bless you. God bless you. Come. Finally, this, this, this afternoon, maybe you want to say, you know what, Lord? Give me some of that stuff that Jesus had. I just, I just want some of that. I, I want some of that. 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 I want some of what Jesus had. I want it. And I don't want to wait till heaven to get it. I want it this side of heaven. This side, this side, this side. I want abundant joy. I want my joy filled up, Ryan. I didn't get into the marathon. Did y'all know that? I really didn't get in. I ran with Ryan's bib. My joy is because Ryan shared with me. Anybody here? Anybody else? You want to say, Father, give me something down here. Put something on my tongue that's sweeter than what I'm going through. Please, please, let me experience a little heaven down here before I get there. Are you here? God bless you. Are you here? Jesus joy. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Proverbs 10, verse 22, Darwin. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. That's the promise. When I bless you, I'm not adding no other stuff with it. I'm just giving you pure, unadulterated joy. Just a few more moments. Anybody else? You may have lost a loved one and the heart is broken and hurting. I came to tell you, God still intends joy for you. God bless you. God bless you. God still got joy for you. Oh man, would it be a shame to go all this way in life and never experience <laughs> I mean you serving Jesus for how many years and you haven't experienced joy I mean that's a shame he said I came to give life and life more abundant I mean that's what he said is he a lie he's lying no I think he's got that joy so if he has it it's for you Come on and claim it. I'm talking about peace above the storm. I'm not telling, I am not asking God to quiet your storm. I'm asking him to quiet you. I'm asking him to joy you in the middle of the storm. Even if 
it never calms down even if they leave and walk away and I know because I talk to you that some of that's going on they have they made the threat and they plan on I'm telling you in spite of it God wants you to have joy the Lord giveth the Lord taketh away blessed be the name of the Lord that's what Job said God bless you. God bless you. Jesus joy this morning. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father. Mm. We want what you have. We want what you have. If you promised it to us, we want it. It would be a shame to have a gift for somebody and never give it to them. But God, that's not you. You're not some Indian. You know, you, you don't give and take back. You are not a God who refuses to give what you have promised. You keep your promises. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I am asking you, for those ones who have come, whatever their reason, I don't need to know it, you have cataloged it in heaven. They're telling you, Lord, they want something better than they have been through. They want something, God, that will uplift them, that will challenge them, that will walk them closer to you, that will give them peace above the storms in their lives. They're asking for Jesus' joy. Power, Lord, to ride over the storms in their life. Power to leave tall trials. Power to swim through grief and pain and come up better than they went in. Power. They're asking for joy, dear God, that leaves them unmoved, settled, that leaves them unbroken in the face of adversity. They're asking for Jesus' power. They're asking for strong joy. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you have delivered it today. By faith, we claim the promise that that which God intends, no one can stop. I'm asking you, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, do a work in the lives of these who have come. Help them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have given them what their hearts have desired. I pray, Father, that they will not doubt. When the feelings come that something happened today and they're not sure about it and the devil whispers to them that nothing has changed, help them to walk in newness of life. To trust God that what you have done, you have indeed done and that they can walk in the assurance that they have your joy. And those, Lord, who are sitting, I know, Father, that there are many who couldn't bear to come up this way or maybe everything is all right. I thank you, Father, for the joy they have. But if there's anything, Lord, that is not right in the lives of those under the sound of my voice who have remained, I pray, God, that you will fix it, that they will experience your forgiveness on your goodness, and that they will turn their entire lives over to you. And then, Father, when you come and you whisk us from this planet all the way to glory, the party is going to be something special. And it's going to be holy. <laughs> For not only will it be preceded by our repentance, not only will we have lived in the joy that you have provided, but in that moment, joy will be in the province of holiness. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Brothers and sisters, it really did happen. Don't doubt. God bless you.